Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon, and I'm Professor of Political Science and Director of the European Studies Center here at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to our first conversation on Europe of the 2021-2022 academic year. Today's topic is the upcoming German elections. You will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A function. Feel free to post a question at any time during the discussion, and our moderator will try to get to as many of these as he can. Feel, uh, feel free to post comments in the chat, uh, but if questions, please put in the Q&A function. Uh, today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center, which is part of the University Center of International Studies at Pitt. It is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors are the American Council on Germany, the Georgia Tech Center for European and Transatlantic Studies, the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida, and the Center for European Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. To learn more about our upcoming conversations on Europe, as well as other programming, and our year of recovering Europe, please visit our website, and that uh, address is in the, in the chat. Here you can also find recordings of past conversations and additional materials. I would like to thank my colleagues Iris Matijevich and Kenny Riley for their help in today's, uh, today's event. I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Stephen Sokol, President of the American Council on Germany. Steve has served as President of the ACG since 2015 and has served um, as President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh for, uh, for five years before that. Prior, he was the Vice President and Director of Programs at the ACG for nearly eight years. Welcome, Steve. Hi, JJ. It is great to Pittsburgh, um, at least virtually. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be moderating today's discussion and cannot think of a better partner than the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And I am really looking forward to the conversation um, that we will have over the course of the next hour and a half or so. Before I introduce the panelists, uh, let me just try to set the stage a little bit. In five days, German voters will take to the polls in what is truly a historic election. After 16 years as chancellor, Angela Merkel is not running for office. She's the first post-war German leader to step down voluntarily, and there has been a lively race to succeed her. And I think, at least, and I think our panelists will agree, that the stakes are high for Germany, for Europe, and for the world. There are incredibly wild gyrations in the polls, and it is very difficult to predict the outcome of the election, even though the election will just take place in a few days. But here's what we know. If the current trends continue to hold, then the Social Democrats and their Kanzlerkandidat, or candidate for chancellor, Olaf Scholz, are poised to make the greatest political comeback in modern German history. The Social Democrats are the oldest political party in Germany, and they're currently polling at 26%, which of course is well below the 30 to 40% it commanded during its heyday, but is a spectacular improvement over the 15% that it was at for much of the year. Meanwhile, support for the Christian Democrats under Amin Laschet appears to be at an all-time low, and it looks likely that the party will receive the support since 1949 when Konrad Adenauer was elected. Support for the party has dropped significantly since February when it was polling at about 35% compared with current numbers in the low 20s. And the Greens, the other party to watch, um, they were polling at about 25% in May, following a great deal of euphoria around its chancellor candidate, Annalena Baerbock, as a possible successor to Angela Merkel, but the party is currently polling at 16%. However, despite the, it is almost guaranteed that the Green Party will have a role in the next government. On election night, we'll know a lot more. At a minimum on Sunday, we'll be able to work out the possible coalition options for the next government. 
But depending on how negotiations go, it could take weeks, if not months, for a new government to form. And the negotiations will be particularly complicated because it's expected that the next government coalition will be made up of three political parties, not two main parties. And the smaller Green Party and the liberal Free Democrats are likely to play a key role in those coalition talks. So long story short, this is a fascinating time to watch German politics. There is a lot of uncertainty about Sunday's election and about the makeup of the next German government. And a lot can happen in the final days of campaigning and certainly in the weeks immediately following the election. We have a terrific panel today to take a deep dive into the German election and together we'll parse what we might expect. Two of our panelists are based in Germany, but all four of them have been following developments closely. We're joined by Dr. Kai Alzheimer. He's a professor of political science at the University of Mainz, and his main research interests are elections and electoral behavior, as well as right-wing populist parties in Germany and Europe. Kai, herzlich willkommen. Thank you so much for having me. Joining us, well, we're delighted, delighted to have you. Um, also with us from Florida is Dr. Marcel Lewandowski. He's a DAAD visiting assistant professor at the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida. His research focuses on the stability and resilience of democracies and the role of pro political parties. Marcel, thank you so much for being with us today. For having me. And Jana Puglerin is the head of the European Council on Foreign Relations office in Berlin, where she also serves as senior policy fellow. She's been in this role since January of 2020. And before joining ECFR, she headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations, also known as the DGAP. Jana, it's wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Likewise. And last but not least, we are, of course, joined by Dr. J.J. Spoon. As you heard, she's Professor of Political Science and Director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research in recent years has focused on European politics and political parties with a special interest in the role of smaller parties. J.J., thanks for being, being here today. Thank you, Steve. So I thought that we could start by talking about the major issues in the election and about what's driving voter interest and how the parties are approaching some of these issues. And so I, I thought maybe we could start with you, Kai, because you're, you're sitting in Germany and, and following very closely what the electorate is thinking about and concerned about but what are the top three, maybe four topics um, that, are, that voters are thinking about as they make decisions about their candidates? Well, I think the most important topic in conversations in Germany is actually climate change and the environment. You might have heard about these terrible floodings we had earlier this summer. And it's really served to drive home the importance of the climate issue. And it's basically in every pre-election poll topping the list of important topics discussed during um, this campaign. The second most important issue is, I think, still the handling of the pandemic that's also on top of people's minds. And the third most important issue is, I think, um, who's going to succeed Angela Merkel. So we're talking a lot about personality, personality facts during this campaign. Uh, and in a sense, this race for succeeding Merkel has become another major issue in this campaign. I think this pretty much sums it up. What I'm not mentioning this time around is immigration, because immigration is not really discussed during this campaign. And this is also reflect in all the polls that I'm aware of. It's simply gone off the radar for now. It, we had a discussion yesterday um, with a pollster who was talking a little bit about the 
what he sees as the main issues. And he, he also noted that migration, which of course was such a topic, uh, an important topic in uh, 2015 um, with, with Europe's migration crisis, uh, has, has really not played much of a role and has been overshadowed, um, as you say, by, by climate questions and concerns, but also by the pandemic response. So, Marcel, let me let me bring you into the conversation. Um, you know, an issue like like climate, one would think, might help um, the Green Party um, and its ability to gain traction. Um, the pandemic response might help the governing parties because they've been largely in charge um, over the course of the pandemic and been able to set the agenda. Um, how, how do you see these issues playing out for e each of the each of the parties? Um, I think, to a great extent, I agree to uh, I agree with what uh, Professor Artsheimer just laid out. I would just um, highlight some aspects that I think are important in how we interpret the importance of these issues. So, first of all. Um, if we look at the last polls, uh, we find that we find a relatively classic scenario uh, in which the most important topic is uh, social justice, then followed by climate, uh, uh, by, by climate change, and then followed by, I think it's either, I think it's a tie more or less between migration and, and, and the anti-corona measures. Um, and on the other side, and I think this is what, what Kai highlighted, and I want to point that out here, is that very early in the game, the media have set the stage for one topic to become the most important one, and that is who is going to succeed Angela Merkel. And that happened um, with the nomination of Annalena Baerbock. And from, from this point on, that is at least my interpretation of things, from this point onwards, um, we were only talking about front runners. We're only talking about front runners. We're talking about who's going to become the next chancellor. And we're not even talking about, at least that is from what I see in the media agenda, we're not even talking so much about their platforms. Um, now, that is a difficult time. You mentioned that for the smaller parties, because the smaller parties are pretty much, although they are competing on distinct platforms, they're reduced in the public, uh, in their public appearance and the discussion on their uh, public appearance reduced to their role of kingmakers. So is the, is the FTP going to elect Olaf Scholz? Uh, what is going to be the role of the, of the party Die Linke? Is it going to be able to be part of a stable uh, R2G government and so on? Um, so I still try to make sense, to sum this up, um, I still try to make sense of the fact that the polls on the one hand show that there are important issues but they're not playing a role at all um, in the overall covering of the campaign in the media. Let me stick with, with Kai and Marcel for just a moment because um, you, you both have mentioned some larger sort of overarching issues that German voters are, are concerned about. Marcel, you just said that social justice is one of the topics that has also played a role in some of the campaigning. Um, but from what I've seen, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion around um, a minimum wage, um, around the social welfare net. And so to, to each of you, to what degree do you think some of these um, more social issues or social questions are playing a role in the minds of, of voters? Kai, perhaps do you, want to go you, first? you first? Okay, um, I think these social issues have become more or less background noise. And that's, that's quite striking because we have quite a range of positions. We have a, a market liberal party, we have a very traditional socialist, the linker party and everything in between. Uh, but it doesn't really seem to affect vote choices very much. Um, in a sense, it's the same with climate change. 80% say it's a very important topic. Nearly 80% say the Greens are the best place to handle it. But we're not talking so much about climate change. We're talking about, is it going to be Armin Laschet? Is it going to be Olaf Scholz? Does Baerbock still have an outside chance? So um, 
personality and personnel has really become the main issue to the detriment um, of many interesting and important policy questions. But I don't want to monopolize this session and I take it that Jana has yeah. to leave us soon. So I, I would rather finish now. <laughs> Marcel, did you want to add anything to that, or or can I can I move on to Yana I because could, I could, but bring I agree really that we should point. hand over at this point to to Yana. So so Yana, um, I, I think for for all of us who are on this panel, um, and for many observers uh, of what's going on in the German election, obviously issues like climate, the pandemic response, migration, are things that can't be addressed within Germany alone. They fall within a, a global context. And yet it was fascinating to watch the three television debates between the chancellor candidates and find that there was hardly a mention of Europe, of foreign policy, of international affairs. Um, as somebody who follows German foreign policy very, very closely, um, what does that say to you about television in Germany, about the moderators, about the candidates, or about public interest in what's going on in the rest of the world? Thank you, Steve. Um, but please allow me a footnote to what Tai and Marcel um, have just explained about the personalization of the election campaign. I think it goes so far that we are really looking for a copy of Angela Merkel um, because both Armin Laschet and Olaf Scholz interestingly campaign to become Merkel in a suit. Um, that goes uh, as far as um, Olaf Scholz basically uh, copying or using uh, Merkel's famous hand gesture. Um, so it's not only that it's about the candidates, it's really about who's the next Merkel. And it's not about a, a change election, it's about a status quo election. So basically, we look for um, the chancellor that has been um, guiding us for the past 16 years. At least that is true for, for um, yeah, I think the majority um, of the Germans or what kind of politicians at least believe what the Germans want. Now to foreign policy, I think, um, I mean, Germany is not such an exception with um, being uh, a bit focused on domestic um, affairs and being stuck with navel gazing. There is this common sense assumption that foreign policy does not decide elections with maybe the one exception in German history, um, recent history when it, uh, uh, when Gerhard Schröder was opposing um, the Iraq war um, and that um, contributed to his victory, I think um, in 2002. But the many politicians, I think, um, are of the opinion that um, campaigning on a foreign policy ticket um, doesn't win them any votes. And that goes as far as in 2017, when Martin Schulz um, was candidate for the SPD, and he has a very um, kind of long history in the European Parliament and is in uh, yeah, has, has wide experience on the EU level, and um, he was basically told to hide this and not to emphasize this, whereas uh, Emmanuel Macron just um, shortly prior to this had, had really campaigned on a European ticket. So in Germany, politicians believe they cannot win elections. Um, so it was not only that no journalist during the three trials asked a foreign policy question, I think there was one on Afghanistan, um, but that, but, but really it was in, limited in the very to this. first one, yes. Yes, um, but but it was also the candidates didn't bring it up. So they managed to talk uh, in three trials about climate change and what they want to do about it without really bringing up the European dimension, without mentioning the Green Deal um, and all this. And yeah, so um, I think it's it's a it's a striking contrast that Europe particularly is super interested in these elections and watches uh, Germany closely, whereas Germany is not that interested in Europe. But this is I am personally wondering why none of the journalists had brought um, the question up. Um, we had a debate about foreign policy early um, before summer break about Nord Stream 2, about dealing with, with China, but one got the impression that once parties had positioned themselves on basically some major aspects, major issues, kind of the, the, the topic was basically sold or, or done. So, um, and, and but I think, I mean, American elections are not decided 
because of foreign policy decisions mostly. And so I think we are not such an exception, um, but I think it's a failure of politicians and journalists not to, to, to mention more why this matters and why it is important because, and this is my last point, um, whoever gets elected certainly doesn't have a strong mandate on foreign policy. So because people just don't know what the candidate stands for and whatever the new chancellor does on foreign policy will not have um, kind of foresee a massive public backing just because he got elected because people really um, mostly have kind of only a vague idea what the positions of the candidates are. I think if if, if anything, um, people are hoping that there will be continuity um, from, from the current government to the next government, um, and not that there will be radical changes. But I think part of that comes from the fact, as you say, Jana, that very little is known about the position that many of the candidates, each of the candidates will take on some of the issues. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, because I think that particularly the Greens have been far more outspoken um, in their policy toward Russia and China uh, than the, the Volkspartei or catch-all parties. Um, but before we go to the parties, I just wanna come back to something that you mentioned, Jana, which is kind of how intertwined um, the role of the German chancellor is um, with Europe and with what's going on in Europe and the fact that the rest of Europe is watching very closely um, what is happening in Germany. Um, your organization, the, the European Council on Foreign Relations, just released a, a survey that explored that a little bit. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to share some of the high level findings of that survey and, and why it is that the Europeans are watching this election so closely. So maybe I think my three main takeaways. First is how incredibly popular Angela Merkel still is, even after these 16 years all over Europe. So we had a hypothetical question who people would vote for as president um, of Europe, a, a post that doesn't exist um, as, as such. And so we pulled in 12 countries and in all of the countries, including in France, uh, Merkel had an easy win, really with um, a, a huge margin. And um, so overall, if you take the aggregate of the 12 countries, it's 41% for Angela Merkel and only 14 for Emmanuel Macron, who was basically the other option that we gave um, people. So um, huge popularity um, for, for Germany. That was the first interesting um, finding to see kind of what, what an, an enormous amount of um, credibility and trust Merkel had built. And this is also shown in the second, I think, interesting finding we asked um, in, in which areas people trust Germany to lead um, on the European level, but also in the European interest. And so there is um, a lot of trust um, comparatively. Um, one third of, of the Europeans um, that we asked trust Germany when it comes to um, economic and um, financial policy and um, kind of closely followed by democracy and, and human rights. Um, but, and that brings me maybe back to, to the foreign policy or to the lack of foreign policy in our election, um, only one fifth of Europeans trust Germany when it comes to dealing with China or, or Russia. So Germany is also not perceived as kind of a very geopolitical foreign policy actor by Europeans. And I think that that comes um, for, for a reason. Um, and the third interesting finding is that when we were looking at um, kind of the German um, trust uh, in, in themselves um, compared to other European countries, um, especially in the area of um, defense and security, but also when it comes to economy and finance, there was much less enthusiasm in Germany about its own leadership role and much less trust um, that the Germans have in the Germans to lead in the European interest um, in, in, in these areas. And overall, we also ask about Germany's um, golden age being in the past, the present or the future. And also we found that the Germans are most convinced that Germany's golden age is basically over also uh, when it comes to the economy. So, and that is also why I think maybe politicians are reluctant to address the, this topic because uh, yeah, the population, I think is not really keen to embrace this leadership role that the rest of Europe and the rest of the world wants to see from Germany. Jana, it, it seems you know, clear to, I think, everybody at this point that the, the next 
um, chancellor will have a very steep learning curve, regardless of who that is, um, after the 16 years that, that Angela Merkel was, was in office. Um, it's important to remember, of course, that she had a steep learning curve when she came into office and that there were a lot of people who thought that she would not last for very long. And yet here it is, um, you know, well over a decade later, and, and she has become, um, in many senses, the leader of, of Europe. Um, but I'd like to, to bring JJ in uh, at this point. You know, we've we've heard a little bit from everybody else about some of the domestic concerns that voters have had about the lack of foreign policy playing a role, about some of the issues that are that are motivating people. And I'm reminded a little bit that after the 2017 election, one of the frustrations that many people had was that um, the the political parties were having a very hard time differentiating themselves. And when one talked to people after the election in 2017, they said they didn't really know what the parties stood for. Um, and so JJ, as you watch um, the, the have you, as you have watched the campaign unfold or the various campaigns unfold, um, have you been able to see how the parties have differentiated themselves from each other or, or do you feel like it's very difficult to distinguish between the different political parties? JJ, I think you're, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay, good, I'm yes. sorry. I have too many remote controls in this room that I'm <laughs> trying to manage. Um, I wanted to just circle back to something that, that Jana mentioned um, as well in terms of um, really not, um, and this gets to sort of the, to, to your question about differentiation, which is that even, and this is that Europe has not been part of this discussion at all, right? And I think that that has become it, among, the, among the candidates and among the parties. And I think that's especially uh, interesting when we look at the Greens and the fact that uh, the Greens have not connected their campaign and what they're saying to the European Green Deal. Right, which has very much been sort of part of the uh, one of the, the the highlights of the current um, leadership within within the EU, and the fact that that has not been part of the discussion at all. And I think that really makes you know a, a very clear point in terms of the election, as Jana said, not being about foreign policy and not being even about Germany's role within the European Union, which is quite surprising, as we know, looking at Germany as one of the leaders of, of course, of, of the EU and very much supportive of the European Green Deal. So I just wanted to, 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 to add that as, as an interesting observation. Um, in terms of the, the differentiation, I think that's a really important question. And we know that parties need to differentiate themselves if they're going to attract voters. Voters need some reason to, be, to choose one party over another. And I think, as has been mentioned in several, in several ways by my co-panelists, the election in some ways has not been, the discussion has not been as much about issues, that it really has been about who is going to succeed on Angela Merkel and who can not so much differentiate themselves uh, from her, but follow in her footsteps. And we'll talk more about Schultz and some of the things that, that Olaf Schultz has done to really have voters see him as sort of the natural heir uh, to, to, the, to the chancellorship. And of course, Schultz being from the SPD, the junior coalition partner, and not, of course, from uh, from Merkel's own party. So I think that the the and so I think this has been a challenge, and I think the differentiation has been, although, and we'll get to some issues, and I'm sure later, but it really has been differ, uh, differentiating based on, as we've talked about, sort of personalization. Um, and I think voters might, you know, really have a chance, you know, have a hard time if asked specific positions on issues, especially with Schultz very much trying to look like, uh, you know, someone said, you know, Angela Merkel in a suit, whoever, whoever said that, um, I think they, they would have a hard time differentiating themselves. Um, and I think we've seen that, especially with the Social Democrats, who, you know, we know need to, based on research, we would think that they need to actually differentiate themselves. Research they actually differentiate themselves if they actually are going to attract voters. Because in the past, we would say that the junior coalition partner is very much seen by voters as 
that voters have a hard time differentiating between the junior coalition partner and the prime minister's party. And this doesn't seem to be playing out as we would expect it based on past experience in Germany and elsewhere across Europe that actually not differentiating and really trying to look like the successor to, to Merkel is actually the strategy that, that the SPD and that Schultz is using. And so it sort of turns differentiation in some ways on its head differentiating on the issues and actually the flip side of that, that the SPD is trying to at least have that image of being sort of the natural successor to, to Merkel. So that's, I think, a very interesting, interesting development as well. And I think, you know, you raise an incredibly important point that um, it's, it is very difficult for the junior coalition partner um, to, to really kind of take credit for things that have happened during the government. Um, and that's actually something that, that Angela Merkel has been masterful in her ability to sort of get credit for um, policies that would not have come about in a more conservative government um, than, than the one that she has had. Um, so, you know, we've started to, to unpack some of this a little bit and look at the close connection between the chancellor candidates and each of their parties. But I'd like to, to maybe pivot a little bit and try to explore um, what explains the, the rapid decline of the, the Christian Democrats and the surge of the Social Democrats and also sort of the, the blip of the Greens. Um, Jana said this is not a change election, it's a status quo election, and yet every time I saw Annalena Babak, she was talking about the future and that this is an opportunity for change and looking at the two gentlemen to her left and right in the television debates and almost pointing out that, that leadership with them would be continuing the status quo and that this is an opportunity for great change. Um, but what we're seeing is sort of opposite trends from what we might have expected. Um, the Social Democrats, there's been a lot of criticism that they've not really had much of a party platform, but they've been buoyed by Olaf Scholz. The Christian Democrats were in a position um, where they'd have to mess up in order to, to lose, and it looks as if they've been, been messing up. So let's talk a little bit about um, why the CDU has, has dropped in favor um, and why the Social Democrats have, have gained in favor. Um, and let me maybe come back to, to Kai first um, on that and then, and then bring the rest of you in as well. Yeah, I'll start with the CDU CSU. I think we shouldn't underestimate the fact that Angela Merkel has become so dissociated from her own party. Her personal popularity is still sky high, uh, but I think for the last 10 years or so, she's been more popular than her party. And I think many people have voted for the CDU because it was led by Angela Merkel. Now, with Merkel leaving the stage, I think many former CDU CSU voters are reconsidering their vote choices and it would be difficult to retain them for the Christian Democrats. But even with Merkel, um, the CDU was CDU CSU was down to 33% of the vote four years ago, which was historically low. And without this vote getter, it, it seems rather natural that the party could further lose. Um, then they had this struggle about who should be the front runner for the Christian Democrats. Should it be Armin Laschet, whose national polling ratings were never that great, or should it be Marco Söder, who came to certain prominence um, during the um, pandemic situation because of his role as Minister President of Bavaria? And uh, so that's, that's another factor, um, that there was first this struggle over who was going to lead the bloc, and then this constant fire from the sidelines, from the Bavarian sidelines, um, against Armin Laschet. He was under friendly fire for much of the campaign. And um, finally, I think we are also certainly not in the tail end of the pandemic, but in the public, public's mind, um, the pandemic was over at least for a couple of months. And that also reduced support for the Christian Democrats, which had gone up during the pandemic because people rally around the flag and the government seemed reasonably 
um, competent to handle a pandemic. But now that summer came and that Merkel was clearly leaving and that Laschet wasn't so brilliant a candidate, I'm, I'm not really surprised <laughs> Um, that their numbers came down. I'm, I'm quite surprised that they're now standing in the low 20s. No, I'm, I'm not quite sure if this really reflects um, the final result. I, I think right now at the moment, people who intend to vote for the CDU are slightly ashamed of that choice and might be rather reluctant to admit that to an interviewer, but I might be mistaken. Enough of me talking. Over to you, Marcel. So, so, Kai, I, I think that's a very important point, though, you know, sort of how fraught the choice of the chancellor candidate was within the CDU and, and yeah. CSU, um, especially when compared with sort of how smoothly the Greens seemed to uh, identify their candidate for chancellor. Um, the Green Party is led by two people, Robert Habeck and Annalena Babak, and while... Um, Amin Laschet and Marcus Suda were sort mm -hmm. of duking it out in public uh, to see who would be the the Kanzler on the on the on the right um, within the the union. Um, the Greens, sort of behind the scenes, uh, had their conversations and discussions, and it was very smooth. Um, is that maybe, and this is maybe addressed to, to one of the other panelists, is that maybe what helped contribute to? Um, this real spike in support for the for the Greens at that at that time. If I'm allowed a very short comment, any any take this, right. sure. This, this arrangement that was pitch perfect and it delivered to the Green soul. So they choose the woman, um, they choose the younger candidate. It all went very smoothly. While, as you said, they were duking it out in the Christian Democrats. Before that, there was this leadership struggle within the CDU uh, between Mats, who would have been uh, another contender for the chancellorship. Um, so, so that was one factor. And I think the other factor was that Annalena Baerbock was relatively unknown. Um, so people could project a lot of their images of an ideal leader on her, much like four years ago with Schulz. When Schulz entered the domestic arena, his numbers were sky high for six weeks or so because he was an unknown quantity, but it was an interesting choice. So people thought, well, I might support the SPD. And I think the same happened with the Greens, but I'm shutting up now. Thank you, Jana and then, and then Marcel, each of you have raised your hands. Why don't you go ahead, Jana? So I just wanted to share my personal theory, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but that's how I perceived it. So in spring, there was uh, a lot of frustration in Germany because of the slow rollout of the vaccines. Um, people were blaming the EU, but also very much so the German government. Um, so and whereas we had a pretty good first wave of the crisis and people were very proud to be Germans and to have crisis manager Merkel at the helmet, the second wave didn't um, was really mismanaged. People were so frustrated. So I think that in spring there was this glimpse of a change election that people really thought okay we need a kind of disruption we need to, to tell them a lesson something needs to change and then that's when the support for the greens was also so high and and Annalena Baerbock and with her her message that she wanted to disrupt the status quo was well received that's that's my personal theory but then um the moment um, kind of the COVID situation got better, more people got um, the shot. Um, it was um, overall Germany was opening up. People were um, satisfied again. Um, this kind of very short kind of fresh uh, air uh, change election brief um, evaporated. That's, that's how I perceived it. And then people realized that what Angela, uh, Annalena Baerbock actually promised um, came with a price tag. So it, it then the more and more it was discussed, it was, yeah, we want change, but we don't want to pay more for, I don't know, for, for our energy. We don't, we, we don't. So, and, and then also the, 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 the way the Greens framed the message, I think they toned down a bit and they tried then ever since to sell their change as something that would renew the country, but would not basically cost that much or would not, I mean, a lot of sacrifices. And that's why I think it's in the end, not a change election, but I think in spring we saw kind of, we had for a moment, um, it felt like one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Marcel, over to you. Um, what I would like to contribute at this point is an interpretation of the CDU and of voting for the SPD. Um, that might speak to um, what uh, Professor Alzheimer said already. Um, we oftentimes think of the CDU, um, maybe even the CDU CSU, but I'm focusing on the CDU here right now. We think of the CDU as a Kanzlerwahlverein, an association for the election of the chancellor. And I think what the last years have shown as uh, counterintuitive as that might sound, is that this is in fact not true. What we are seeing here is a popular chancellor um, being at the helm of a party that has been in constant ideological crisis over uh, the Eurozone question. The AFD in its very early days was to a great extent, not totally, but to a great extent, a CDU split off that can be traced back even to the Maastricht trees when you look at the history of the AFD. And then uh, among uh, others, um, uh, same-sex marriage and um, uh, the refugee crisis. So Angela Merkel had a very pragmatic st style and offered the party a trade-off. She took a more centrist position. The, a the CDU was able to win elections with Angela Merkel. But at the same time, you can see that there were discussions going on within the party. And I think what we're witnessing now is, and that might also shape the phase of the party way after, after the election, depending what the outcome will be, especially if they end up in opposition, um, is that um, this is a party that is totally unsure about its own overall ideology. And I think we have to acknowledge first that party members of the CDU take their own ideology much more serious than, we th than it's oftentimes perceived. Now the SPD, in mm -hmm. fact, I'm not so surprised that the AFD, that the SPD, I'm sorry, is able to, 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 to rise in the polls because I don't even want to, like at this point, mention their candidate, which might have been a good choice, but that was hardly a perception of the future by the SPD. Um, I would say that it reflects the long-term likelihood that we oftentimes see of people being like of the long-term likelihood of voting for the SPD, because there's a lot of voters who can't imagine voting for the SPD, right? And what happened is that two candidates were, were out. First, Annalena Baerbock, who was a projection screen. I totally uh, agree with uh, Jana Puglin here. Um, then Amin Laschet, who, uh, who's, who failed as a candidate. Um, and then the third possible uh, option that, re that, that remains is Olaf Scholz. And Olaf Scholz might be the right candidate at this point. Um, I'll leave it to that because otherwise I have a tendency to talk for too long. I'm sorry for that. Well, let's let's stick with, with Olaf Scholz a little bit because um, there have been a couple of questions that have come in about Olaf Scholz and about the Social Democrats. Um, one of our viewers writes, there's been a lot of talk about Olaf Scholz and the social in a Social Democrat and being a continuation of um, a Merkel government, if the SPD is able to form a government, how will Scholz and his party draw a distinction between their government and the past 16 years of CDU leadership? Um, has the SPD indicated that it will pursue moderate policies like the Schröder government, or will they pursue a more left-wing agenda. And that speaks a little bit to something that Marcel touched on, sort of some of the divisions within the, the party. Um, but JJ, is, is that something that you'd like to respond to? Um, sort of what, what might happen with an SPD-led government? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, no, I think I think that's um, something um, important, interesting to think about, um, because I think an SPD Schultz is obviously more of a moderate than many than many in his party, and we know that a government, if he was to lead the government, and we'll talk about what various governing coalitions might look like, obviously will be likely a three-party coalition, and what that looks like, um, we can obviously, we, we can speculate, we can talk about, but um, as we know, there will be a fair fair bit of compromise in what, what, what that looks like. Um, you know, we can, um, you know, expect 
depending on who those coalition partners are, depending on how what the negotiations look like, what the ministry, you know, the how, how things um, are distributed in terms of ministries, you know, what that government is going to look like, and if it's going to govern more as a you know more as a centrist government on, uh, or more to the left. And I think some of that will depend on, let's say, if it's a left. Uh, a left-wing government with the Greens and Delinka. We have spoken much about uh, Delinka, the left, the left party, or if it's a government that um, is including, for example, the FDP, uh, the Free Democrats as well. Um, so I think, uh, so I think a lot of what that government will look like will it will be uh, in terms of what we see in, in terms of what that government looks like in terms of what the how he'll govern and if he'll govern more to the left or more to the right. I think it's important uh, to, to keep in mind that with the SPD, that the membership needs to approve of any government. And if the membership looks different than the, the, the potential chancellor, that can obviously lead to longer government negotiations, a longer period where after the election before we actually have a government, which we saw in 2017. But that took quite a while until we reached um, the, the, the government that we um, are, uh, that Angela Merkel is heading up, which is, as we know, is a, is a grand coalition with, with the SVD. Um, and so I think that's another question in terms of what that government will look like, because the party, uh, it does have, to, the, the, that vote does have to happen, and it does have to go back to, 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 to the members of the party that are more to the left. So I think it's a little bit, you know, and I, again, this is kind of the challenge that when we go from elections to governing. Right? So that the parties run on you know, their own platforms, they try and differentiate, although we talked a bit about how that hasn't quite worked as we might expect this time, given the nature of this, this election, as, as we've talked about. But then when we get to, to, to governing, right, it's all about compromise. Right? No, the, the Social Democrats are not going to be able to govern by themselves. We know that obviously Germany has a long history of, of two-party coalitions. We're looking perhaps at a three-party coalition. So what that government looks like will it will be a matter of what the negotiation process looks like um, among after we see what the election results are. So I think you know we can kind of speculate on what that government might look like and if it will be more of a centrist government or not. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's what you know what we see after the election in terms of moving from election results to what the government itself is going to look like and the kind of compromises that have to take place. So I think. I think that's a, a perfect segue to, to talk a little bit about some of the potential coalition options. Um, obviously, we'll be a lot smarter on, on Sunday evening when, when we know the numbers, we'll know what's mathematically possible, um, and we'll be able to guess at what's politically viable. Um, it seems at the moment, at least, as if a traffic light coalition between the Social Democrats the Green Party and the Free Democrats is the most likely constellation. Um, but there has also been talk about a red, red, green coalition that would include the left party or a black, green, yellow um, coalition, also known as a Jamaica coalition with the Christian Democrats, the Greens and the Free Democrats. Um, as Several of you have touched upon um, a lot of compromises will have to be made during the coalition negotiations, um, and so it might take a long time for this for this new government um, to form. But I guess let me maybe start with you, Yana, because I know that that you're on a, a tight schedule, and get your sense of what you think the most likely coalition might be and what some of its characteristics might be? Actually, I think it's really too close to call. Um, it really depends, um, as Kai Arzheimer has said, um, or Marcel, um, it, one of the two has said that it's not by no, by no means certain that the CDU will really end up with 20% of the votes. Um, and I think it really depends um, which party comes first, um, whether kind of chances are higher for a Jamaica or a traffic light coalition, and also what the what the kind of um, margin is um, between the CDU um, and the SPD. So if the CDU, even if um, it comes second, dares to, to start coalition negotiations. Um, and I think that is that is difficult to justify uh, if uh, kind of you have lost more than 10% um, of the vote maybe. Um, but 
there are several people um, claiming that the CDU will at least try to form this Jamaica government because the FDP also has um, emphasized several times that this would be their preferred option. Um, and the worst case scenario is that we would have this um, yeah, that kind of parallel negotiations, basically, um, or one after the other, um, and that kind of both uh, Armin Laschet and Olaf Scholz compete for getting the FDP and the Greens on board would give a terribly strong hand also to the smaller coalition partners and would possibly take forever. And then there is this wild card of a red, red, green um, or red, green, red um, coalition that most experts have said will never happen because of foreign policy. But interestingly, Die Linke just um, recently had um, kind of basically put NATO um, off the table as, as a major obstacle because it was always that the Die Linke wants to leave basically NATO or replace it with another security organization. And now um, uh, prominent voices have said, we will not let coalition negotiations fail over this NATO topic. And uh, I remember that in 1998, the Greens also needed a special um, phrase in the coalition treaty on NATO and they were not completely sold. Um, so I think it's not, if, if I don't know, if, if a red, Green red coalition is possible. And if the link really credibly signals that it's for them, it's about the domestic project and they can live with some foreign policy compromises, which they could not, which they could never um, in the past, maybe there is a temptation to, to, to look into that a, bit, a little closer if um, for a traffic light, the FDP really demands kind of the finance ministry and blocks everything that um, the SPD and the Greens agree on, because basically you would have these two opposing forces in a traffic light coalition and the FDP is opposing major projects, um, especially when it comes to fiscal policy and, and um, also on, on, on the European level. Um, so maybe there is a temptation, but I think I'm certainly an outlier in thinking this is at least possible because many analysts say that this is not an option, kind of this very left uh, government. I think that's one of the big questions that's being asked right now. And, and indeed, even in, in our sample of questions from viewers, um, a question that's come up a lot of sort of how viable a governing coalition with the left party um, could actually be. And I see, Marcel, you, you raised your hand, so I assume you, you'd like to add something to this point. Yes, um, thank you. I uh, um, think, actually, I would tend to agree with, with uh, Jana here at this point. I think that um, a coalition with the left party is not totally out of the question, but whether it works or not depends on the composition of the party group of the left in the Bundestag. So what we have to understand when we talk about the left party is that the left party is not a centralistic party. The left party is a movement party that includes a lot of different uh, violently competing groups um, um, under one umbrella, that is the left party. And whether or not such a government would work does not only depend on whether their leadership would agree on that, um, because the left has the left activists and also left Parliamentary, members of parliament, they have a tendency of voting against their own uh, leadership. And depending on how the parliamentary group is composed, this, this could happen indeed. So um, I think um, one has to really look into the details here. And what we should keep in mind is that when it comes to the, um, when it comes to uh, foreign policy, it's not only about NATO, of course, or the EU, but what happens next time uh, Israel is under attack from the Gaza Strip. What happens then? Um, what happens if, they, if the government tries to follow a resolution on that, uh, following uh, the good tradition of, of, German, of German policy with Israel? Um, what happens with a left party that includes a lot of radicals that are, to say the least, very critical towards Israel, also not only the Israeli government, but also the state of Israel? So depending on how many these are within the parliamentary group of the left, this could really pose a problem to a red, red, green government. 
I, I think that the, the point that you've touched on too also indicates sort of the, the spread of viewpoints um, within the Social Democratic Party, but even that we're seeing within the Green Party. Um, and it comes back to this, this question of, again, sort of differentiating between the parties and trying to figure out what they stand for, um, because there are some voters who are within the SPD, but for whom the left party is appealing in some levels. There are some within the SPD for whom the left party is, is a, a no-go area and where it's highly unlikely that they would work together. And so we'll have to see sort of how some of these internal pressures play out. The party that we've not really talked much about that has the potential to play a very important role um, in the coalition discussions is the Free Democratic Party. And um, JJ, you've done you know, a lot of work on the role of, of smaller parties. Um, the Free Democrats have the potential to serve as, as kingmakers um, in the next government. They might help shape the next government. But it's important to remember that it, after the last election, the Free Democrats walked away from negotiations to be part of the government. And that ultimately led to the current Grand Coalition government folding, uh, um, forming. So uh, JJ, what, what are your thoughts on, on the role of the FDP and how they might position themselves after the election? Um, no, I think I think that's that's uh, you know an important question. In um, recent polls, the FDP is at about eleven percent. Um, so that is, you know, import, important to keep in mind that they're just slightly below the green. So they really are, you know, could potentially be part of, of the conversation, whether in a traffic light co coalition that we've talked about between, the, you know, the SPD and the Greens and the FDP or the, the so-called Jamaica coalition between the CDU Greens and, and the FDP. And so those are two very, you know, very different coalitions in that, in terms of the, the type, the, the, the party, whether it's a center right party or center left party. Um, but I think that, um, you know, they could play an important kingmaker role as we've talked about, because we're looking at three -way co a likely three-way coalition, whether it's headed up by the, um, the CDU or the SVD. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, the FDP under Christian Lindner did walk out of negotiations in 2017. Um, with with the CDU, and as you said, that was how we ended up with, in some ways, the, the least preferred option of, of, of many, which was the Grand Coalition. And at the time, that was obviously, uh, you know, the least preferred option of the Social Democrats, because we know that, again, this election perhaps is, is an outlier, um, and, we'll, and we'll have to see to see what happens. But typically, um, the junior coalition partner really does, uh, you know, uh, does not do well in subsequent elections, right? They may be able to get some things that they had on the agenda accomplished in government, but voters have a very hard time differentiating uh, be between between the two. Um, and so the the SPD, uh, like many social democratic parties across Europe, was really um, polling and, and not doing very well. And so again, uh, this isn't the, the question on the table at the moment, but Sch the Schultz's sort of rebounding is, is I think, surprising in that way that um, based on being a junior coalition partner, but just sort of the fortunes of social democratic parties, uh, not only in Germany, but across Europe, that they really are struggling to find their place. And some of that is because of the Greens. And some of that is because of the, of, of the, of the Christian democratic or conservative parties as well, sort of moving in on their you know, sort of territory in terms of, of, of their positioning as well. Um, so that, that's all to say that, um, uh, that what we ended up with last time was very much because of, of what the FDP um, chose to do. And so while not a kingmaker of the election itself, they really did play a large role in the government that we ended up with in, in 2017. So I think that they could very much play an important role in either of the, 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 the so-called traffic light or the Jamaica coalition. And I think it'll just be a, a matter of what the election results look like and the negotiations over ministries and positioning. And you know, we have to always remember when we're talking politics, the personalities, of course, play a, play a large role. And if the, the parties are not willing to work each, with each other because of the of just pers personality conflicts and things like that, um, and arguably, uh, you know, that's happened in the past. So that could, um, you know, really uh, affect what that 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 result may look like and what the role of the FDP uh, the FDP uh, plays in that. But I think, you know, just a final point, and then I pass it on to, to others. Is you know, I think it's a risk. And you know, this is a risk that smaller parties have to play, have to take, right? The risk of 
governing or the risk of staying, you know, and, and the sort of the, the benefits and the rewards of being in government, right? Um, on the one hand, you're in a good government that gets you the accountability and the credibility and all of that, but the potential of what that may do in future elections. And so it's very much kind of weighing those those things um, that, that, that will be important for the FTP. So I think that I think that's very helpful in terms of sort of understanding um, some of, of of what's going on and and some of the things to watch. Um, we in our conversation today have have not really talked about the alternative for Germany, which um, also is uh, polling at about eleven percent of the vote, um, down from the thirteen percent that it won in in the election in twenty seventeen. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we haven't really been talking about the AFD is because they don't stand a chance of being part of any government, but will be relegated to the to the opposition again. But some of our viewers have some questions about how the AFD is doing, how their populist appeals um, are playing out. And I know that both you, Kai and, and Marcel, have focused a little bit on populist movements um, in Europe and particularly in Germany. And so I'd like to get your take um, on how the AFD is is resonating um, in Germany, and whether you think that that is a that that party is a, a factor you reckoning with and and watching more closely. Maybe Kai, why don't you go first, and and then Marcel? Okay, um, so the AFD is obviously less exciting than four years ago because we kind of got used to it. It's more or less normal now to have such a party in state parliaments and even in the Bundestag. And so the, the story of this election is, is not about them. Uh, but you mentioned they got about 13% of the vote four years ago, and that was under almost ideal conditions. They had a lot of momentum following the state elections, and um, migration was still pretty high on the agenda, and there was a certain novelty value. Now, four years later, and this have been difficult years for the AFD, they are standing at more or less the same value in the polls. And for me, that's quite an achievement, actually. Um, and my take is um, that they have a certain base on which they can rely. The party is under a lot of pressure. It might come on this even closer scrutiny by um, what is effectively Germany's secret service uh, because there are credible allegations that they're working with right-wing extremists outside the party, that there might be right-wing extremists within the party. And still, um, they might get 11, 12, perhaps even 13 percent. So I, I would say they have pretty much established themselves as a political force on the other hand, they're politically completely isolated. We're not even considering any coalition involving them, um, which creates full-on problems in the eastern states where they're very strong and where it is very difficult to form coalitions that exclude the AFD. Thank you, Kai. Uh, Marcel. Um, yeah, echoing uh, to an extent what Kai said, um, the AFD, we've, if we look at um, studies on the voters of the AFD, um, we find that one characteristic among others um, is uh, distinguishing their voters from the voters of all other parties, and that is their populist attitudes. Now, what does populism as an attitude mean? It means that you're basically discontent with the political elite as such, you consider them not being legitimate representatives of the people. And on the other hand, you demand democracy to be about all uh, the sovereignty of the pure people alone, right? So this being said, this is something that we only find with voters to, to a large extent, only find with voters of the AFD, not even so much with voters of the left party, surprisingly. Um, what does that lead to? That leads to the fact that um, a colleague uh, from the Wissenschaftsinter uh, Berlin für Sozialforschung, um, Eiko Wagner, has shown that um, their voters are not available anymore to any other party. They're only voting for the AFD. They cannot be attracted by another party, um, or at least hardly. So parties have discussed whether they should shift to the right, like the C CSU has done that in the Bavarian campaign 2019. It didn't work. It legitimized the AFD. So that didn't work. But at the same time, we also see that their electorate is pretty much a fortress, right? It's a fortress of 11 to 12% of the electorate. 
Um, these voters hardly move. They hardly will vote for any other party. Um, but at the same time, the AFD is also, because it is that extreme, it is unable to attract any other voters. And um, it has a done an interesting, like what we've seen a pandemic is an interesting competition, I would say, between the AFD and the FDP, because both parties have tried to capitalize on the topic of the pandemic, but the FDP was based on what her voter base, what its voter base is, been a little more successful because the FDP was able to, I would say, to appeal to those who are unsatisfied with the um, with uh, how the pandemic was handled and there might be um, uh, civil liberties that, uh, that are being um, limited in a way, but without being anti-democratic. And the framing of the AFD was anti-democratic. The framing of the AFD was, this is a crisis of democracy and this is, the, this is dictatorship being installed. And this was only, by this, it was only able to appeal to uh, the voters that it already had. And this is why we see stagnation, at least this, this is my interpretation of that. For the future, however, uh, can I mention it? We're looking at state parliaments. And um, it might be that, it's, let's just speculate here, that the CDU, CSU, that ends up in a position, there will be internal, there will be an internal fragmentation and there will be internal discussions um, we're looking at Friedrich Merz. We may be looking at, uh, uh, at Maassen if he makes it to Parliament. Maybe he becomes a player, maybe not. And it might be that a discussion comes up again within the CDU-CSU to form a center-right block. We had this, these, these discussions in state um, uh, and in uh, regional branches of the, CD, of the CDU. And it might come up if the, if the CDU suffers um, from a very bad result in, in the election. Well, and, and maybe as a, as a footnote to that, um, you know, the, because the, the Christian Democrats um, really need support, really need votes right now in this election, do you see them going after AFD voters? Um, or, you know, coming back to your point, Marcel, that, that there are some people who vote, you know, party line no matter what. Um, are those people... Um, who are, you know, uh, ideologists, I ideologues um, for the AFD, not really going to move into, into the CDU just to help um, get the CDU into government? That was a question directly to me, or um, was it to the panel? Because I don't want to... Yeah, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, no, go so, ahead. Okay, thank you. So um, I would say we shouldn't under... So yes, on the one hand, I think we will see what we see here is that there are attempts in the CDU to attract these voters, or at least not scaring right-wing voters away. Um, one small example of that is um, uh, Armin Laschet being unable to distance himself from uh, Massa. Right, the former uh, leader of the Federal Office of the, uh, the of Protection of the Constitution, who is a right winger within the party, um, and he's unable to distance himself from from whenever he's been asked about him, he's unable to distance himself from that. And I would say that there is a certain form of tactics in there um, that is that you don't want to scare away the right wing voters. However, I think what we underestimate here is that in the few that like in the in the mid in the like in the mid run um this is probably not successful because voters for the afd are not only right wing it's not only about immigration it's only about it's also about their understanding of democracy and their deep discontent with the ruling class quote unquote and this is something that a mainstream party can't overcome now in the future it might be that the cdu is tempted to shift into a more populist direction itself to overcome that after Armin Laschet. But this is highly speculative, um, but uh, I think it's not totally unlikely. Thank you. Let me bring JJ in. She just sent me a note that she has something that she'd like to add um, as well. So, so JJ, over to you. Uh, thank you. So. Uh... So to just uh, shift gears a bit and, and circle back to the Greens, I think there are some important things that um, we haven't brought up um, as we're talking about some sort of smaller parties, whether it's the FDP, the AFD, or the Greens. Uh, and I think something that's important, to, a couple of things that are important to mention. One is, although the Greens, and I think Steve, you, you know, mentioned sort of the blip of the Greens right after Baerbach was nominated in April, polls were quite, were very high. 
membership in the Greens, you know, went up considerably. Uh, and some of that, I think, it, and it's, I think, important to know, regardless of, you know, what happens with the Greens in the, in, in the election next week, is this is the first time that they've run a chancellor candidate. And I think that that is an important um, evolution within the party, and that it's not just contesting seats in the Bundestag, but that it is actually out there in front um, and on the stage of the debates and in, in the conversation to be at the time, although now we're not talking about Baerbach as a potential chancellor, as a potential chancellor, but there was a time, I think Jan was talking about this earlier, this summer where that could have been a reality. Obviously, that is not that is not something we're discussing anymore. Um, but that that but that is an important you know, sort of evolution as we think about sort of the Greens and where they have been as a party and, and how they've really become really a, a mainstream party. Um, and, and as we've seen, obviously, their polling numbers were up near 30% earlier in the campaign. Now they're obviously down um, it, uh, in, the mid, in the mid-teens. But that, that I think, is important to, to highlight in as we're talking about sort of the elections and, and what's going on as well. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, we sort of, as we were talking about different potential coalitions, we had mentioned this Jamaica coalition, which uh, obviously would be the CDU, CSU as as chancellor uh, with the Greens and 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 the FDP. And I think for some that may seem sort of anachronistic to have the Greens in government with a, with a Christian Democratic Party. And I think it's important to to, to mention that this is not. Uh, without precedent. Um, so if we think about in, in the uh, state parliaments uh, uh, across the 16 states in Germany, the Greens are actually in 10 of those state governments, so they do have quite a lot of governing experience, and five of those they are in government with the CDU, sometimes by themselves, other times with the SPD or the FDP, all sorts of different it's not that it's that this would be something that was completely unprecedented, obviously unprecedented at the federal level, but not at the state level. Uh, so I think that's important um, for those viewers that are trying to wrestle with all of these colors and thinking sort of ideologically what you know about sort of the social democrats on the left and the Christian democrats on the right. So um, and whether that uh, so I think that's important to point out. And then the last point I wanted to just make is that this uh, at the national or at the federal level, um, the sort of Christian Democratic Green uh, governing coalition is not without precedence in Europe. Um, and so we have a couple of examples. We only need to look to Austria, uh, to Germany's east, uh, where we have a governing coalition between the OVP, the conservatives in, in, in Austria, and the Greens um, as an example of that. So again, um, this discussion of the, this, this uh, black, green, yellow coalition um, again, not without precedent in, in Germany at the state level, and also we're seeing that more in the in the European context. And I think that again, just uh, you know, is an, an example of how the party has really evolved from perhaps the image of the Greens that we have coming out of the 1970s, Joshua Fischer entering Parliament in his Birkenstocks with his marijuana plant, and, you know, all of those kinds of things. So I think it's you know important to just put the Greens in that context as well, regardless of of what the, what happens in the elections. So, thanks. Those are, are all, I think, very important comments that you've made. And I think, you know, you're right that there's been a, fa a fascinating evolution of the Green Party from the late 1970s, early 90s, single issue party in Germany to really a party that is multifaceted at this point. And as you pointed out, not to forget that the Greens served in government um, under Gerhard Schroeder with Joschka Fischer as vice chancellor and foreign minister. Um, and throughout this time, you know, they've been expanding and developing further. And so, you know, one of the questions that, that poses itself in my mind as I sort of reflect on Germany and German politics over the last 20 years or so, is there's a whole generation of voters who, um, have known no chancellor other than Angela Merkel, but have um, you know now vote for someone new. And it has been very interesting to look at at some of the polls by by age and to see how different age groups um, are looking at at levels of support and which party they would like to support. And the younger generation is much more strongly in support of, of green candidates. I think part of it has to do, of course, with the issues, with climate change being a, a high topic, with the green topic, with the Green Party also being a party that is focused on the future. 
And so one of our, our viewers is curious what um, the likelihood is that youth turnout might have an impact on the election. Um, and the viewer goes on to write, which party would benefit more by young voters um, turning out to Kai, you were sort of nodding your head as I was speaking there. Do you want to, to respond to that question? Yeah, um, sadly, I don't think it will have much of an effect on the election because there are not that many young people in Germany. We are an aging society and turnout is strongly correlated with age. So we have more old people and they turn out in higher numbers. And uh, it, it would take a lot of turnout amongst the young to really swing that election. So I, I don't expect any big impact of that. When it comes to you know, other questions, um, as one's looking ahead to the election, um, there's, there's uncertainty because there's a, it seems to be a, a fairly high percentage of voters who are undecided. Um, there has been a record number of requests for ballots by mail. Um, it seems as if not all of those ballots have been submitted um, and undoubtedly part of the motivation for people to vote by mail um, was the pandemic and not wanting to, to be out in public. Um, but you know, one of the, the topics that you, Marcel, have, have done some research on is, is politik verdrossenheit, sort of reluctance, uh, frustration that people have had with, with going out to vote. Do you think it's widely recognized that this is a historical election? And is that something that's motivating people or will motivate people to, to go out and vote? Or, you know, as we look at the, the candidates for chancellor, um, is there sort of a, a lack of enthusiasm um, because there's nobody that's really um, sort of energizing everybody as, as the, the fantastic chancellor candidate? Due to the uh, lack of data, I'm pretty much in the realm of interpretation here. So, but let's speculate. Um, I would assume that the perception of change and of the election being a chance for change is highly correlated with the party preference. So those who vote for uh, the Greens um, are uh, more uh, prone to the idea that this election is all about change and they have the, ch they have the chance to implement that, especially when it comes to, to, to the climate, uh, to the climate uh, issue. Um, this being said, the perception of whether an election is historical or if you're able to make a change or not might also depend on the issues that, that are important to you, right? If you're only about taxes, um, then this election, uh, then you're not as enthusiastic in this election if, as if you were about a climate, the climate issue. So, um, but I think that this has, um, um, this has been a little uh, watered down throughout the election because at, it's pretty much, uh, we had three trielle, right? But actually um, it has become more or less a duel be between two parties, which is the CDU, CSU and the SPD. And um, both of these parties, uh, Jana said that before, um, both of these parties pretty much represent the status quo to the extent that this is about who is going to replace Angela Merkel and who is professional enough to replace her. Otherwise, Annalena Baerbock would be higher, much higher in the polls, which, which the Greens are not right now. Um, so I would say that uh, this is pretty much, although the situation is pretty is historical, um, to the extent that we're voting for a completely new candidate, I would not say that this is, and this is due to the fact that we're only talking about the success of Merkel here, that this is really perceived by the broader public. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're rapidly running out of time, um, and and I'd like to maybe cover two more topics before we before we end today. Um, over the course of the the conversation, we've gotten a couple of questions that have asked um, about just election interference in general in, in Germany. Um, one person asks um, whether there's any possibility that the election in Germany could be rigged. 
Um, another asks about voter fraud in Germany and whether that's something that exists. Um, and then of course, there's the, the perennial question um, around election interference from the outside, largely from Russia. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on the, the validity of this election and the security um, of this election? Uh, Kai, you're sort of smiling. So let me, yeah. let me maybe come to you first. Oh, I'm I'm naturally a cheerful person. That's why I'm smiling, uh, but I'm actually not worried about the uh, validity or safety of this election. This is because we're so much stuck in the past. The whole process is run with papers and pencils. There's literally a paper trail, and I think there is no evidence whatsoever that the process itself might be compromised by outside electronic interference because we're still working with fax machines and telephone lines and stuff like that, which is pretty safe. Um, there has been a lot of concern about disinformation campaigns um, that could interfere with the outcome of the election, but I, I don't see really um, any big swings in the public mood that could be linked to fake news, fake information. So I'm very much unconcerned about that too. But perhaps I'm naive. And, and JJ and Marcel sort of watching the election from further away, um, do, do you have any concerns about, about the election? I mean, I can just jump in real quick. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, that, um, I mean, that's my sense as well from what Kai mentioned, just in terms of the, uh, literally, there's a paper trail because everything is um, very much, <laughs> very antiquated in that respect. Um, I have not, you know, really seen or, or heard much discussion at all about, you know, this concern in the, in the, in the context of the German election. Um, I mean, I think it's important, you know, from, you know, an American perspective, we're, you know, obviously coming out of an election that was, you know, Hyper politicized, lots of questions of validity, lots of question, you know, that and there's, it's, that's still being discussed. But I think that that, not to say that some of those conversations aren't, aren't happening in the European context, but I think that you know we need to to be be careful of how much we're taking our own experience in the 2020 election here and projecting it on to well, that's just happening in all elections around the world these days. So I think there was something, you know, in some ways particular to that, to our election in, in, in 2020. Again, not to say that there mm -hmm. can't be interference, of course, you know, uh, and there's all sorts of misinformation campaigns and disinformation campaigns, but um, I think you just need to be, to be a bit careful with that. Um, and like I said, I, my sense is, is that there is very little concern in this, in this election of any, any of that happening. Yeah. You, Marcel, you're nodding your head. I don't know if you want to add anything or, or if, if everything's been said on this. No. Um, then, then let's let's maybe um, sort of start to to, to close out, close out here. And I, I guess um, I have a, a maybe blitzfrage or lightning question um, for each of you, and and then a, a closing question. And and the the lightning question would be: um, Do any of you think that a two party coalition is feasible, um, even with the CDU and CSU being seen as one, but, you know, so do CDU, CSU with one other party or the SPD with one other party, or is that impossible? Um, that's the, the blitz question. Uh, Kai, why don't you go first? Uh, interestingly, the two major parties are not really ruling out that option, but I think it might be mathematically feasible if it's by any means, political avoidable, I don't think they would do it, especially not the Social mm -hmm. Democrats. They were not keen to go into this last grand coalition. Uh, I, I really can't see them entering another grand coalition. Even if, if they were the bigger party? Yes, even, even then, um, I think it would massively undermine their credibility. They seem to bounce back at the moment. Um, they wouldn't tie themselves again to the Christian Democrats if they, they don't have to, and they, they wouldn't have to because there would be other options. JJ, is there any chance of a red-green coalition? 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with, with with what Kai said in terms of the of the unlikelihood of a, of a grand coalition um, as well. I think in terms of a red green coalition, I mean, mathematically, I don't think the numbers add up unless something drastically changes between now and Sunday. Um, you know, right I, right now the we, the, the two parties together won't get over that 50% threshold. And I think it's important to, to mention, which hasn't come up, is that in Germany does not have any tradition of minority governments, right? If we were talking about other countries in Europe, we might be thinking about whether that could be, right? We might be looking at a single party minority government, a red-green coalition that is a minority government, but that, is, as we know, is not, is not uh, the case in Germany. So I don't think that really um, if we're ruling out an SPD CDU coalition, which I think I think I agree with, that um, an SPD Green coalition without another party, whether it's the FDP or possibly the Linka, um, I, I don't think it's possible. So I, I my 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 vote is for some <laughs> for some combination of a three party coalition. And Marcel, I agree, um, with one exceptions, one exception. I could imagine another grand coalition if the SPD comes in strongest and all other options fail. Um, so if they say we are, uh, we're at the help, we have the chancellor, um, we may, might be even, maybe they even have a minor, majority of the ministers, including uh, the key departments, uh, and they're able to implement a majority of their policies in a coalition treaty, um, I think it wouldn't be too hard for the party leadership to defend that uh, on a uh, on a party conference or, or maybe even a plebiscitary vote within the party. Thank you, Marcel. Um, Marcel, I'm, I'm going to stick with you and and ask each of you in in 30 seconds to to share with our viewers what the one or two things are that you are watching in the final days of campaigning. Uh, I am watching the FDP. I am watching what the FDP is going to say about possible future coalitions. Um, I am watching whether they are going to shift from the preference for Jamaica to a more open strategy. They have flip-flopped a little in the past. And uh, the other uh, thing I am watching is um, the performance of the two frontrunners, which is Olaf Scholz and uh, Armin Laschet. Um, but this is pretty much more out of personal interest. And JJ, what, what are the things that you're watching in the last days of campaigning? I mean, I think, you know, similar to, to, to what Marcel said, especially with the FDP and what they're, um, how they're framing things in the next, in the coming days. I think, I mean, personally, um, probably no surprise after this, <laughs> after the, the discussion, I'm also, you know, interested to see what the Greens do and if they, you know, how they're positioning themselves as a potential coalition partner um, and what kind of, uh, you know, if there is any, I don't expect to see any sort of shifting in positions at all, but just in terms of sort of how Baerbach is talking about um, working with other parties, if that gives us any sort of sense of what uh, the government formation process will look like after Sunday. I mean, I think that's a, a good point. I think it was clear in the last television debate that this was making overtures to Olaf Scholz to show that she and the Greens could be good coalition partners. And it struck me that, you know, her fight is now um, to make sure that her party comes in with more than 12 to 15 percent of the vote, maybe in the 15 to 18 percent of the vote, so that the Green Party can be a strong coalition partner and has leverage in some of the coalition negotiations. Um, and yeah, and I think um, last... Yeah. Me? Go ahead. Y yes, I'm watching. JJ. Well, the... JJ wanted to add something. JJ, please. No, I. Yeah, sorry. No, I. <laughs> I was just going to say, Steve, to, to your point. I think you know, watching. You know, obviously, what the, you know, of course, we're all very curious what you know the election results look like on Sunday. But I think you know how the Greens are trying to get themselves over that sort of uh, you know that threshold to be a second partner in a coalition because obviously as we know that will that, that is what will determine the the ministries that the parties have and that that can have a huge impact after after the election so okay. yeah i'm watching the fallout from that raid in the ministry of finance uh, you know that charles has long been accused of a lack of oversight 
um, over the authorities tasked with uh, curbing money laundering in Germany. That now came to a head with prosecutors showing up, going through offices. And I wonder if this leads to a last minute swing away from the SPD and perhaps back to the CDU, which would be kind of ironic, but non nonetheless. So that is the one thing I watch. And the other thing I'm, I'm really interested in is if the CDU, CSU end up with perhaps really 20, 22 percent of the vote, what will this mean for the CDU as a party? And what will this mean for the alliance between the two Christian democratic parties? Because I, uh, I think Suda might already look for the exit and try to distance uh, himself and his party from the CDU because there's an upcoming state election in Bavaria. And at the end of the day, they are their own party, might go their own way. Well, I want to thank all three of you and, and also Jana Puglerin for this fascinating conversation. You've given us a lot to think about um, and a lot of things to watch in the next few days as um, the campaigns come to an end. Um, and certainly there will be food for thought for us in the, the weeks ahead as we see the fallout from this election and the potential negotiations for a, the creation of a new government. So I wanna thank all of you for this, this fantastic discussion.